All right, now officially welcome to Miami Champagne Week 2021. My name is Alessandra Steves. I'm the director of wine education for Florida Wine Academy, co-founder for Miami Champagne Week, um, Vino Summit 305 Wines. Very happy to be here. Today is day one. We have a week ahead of us with five different events um, between in-person and webinar. Um, so Miami Champagne Week is completely sold out for this year, but uh, this webinar will be recorded and so you have the chance to watch it again uh, if needed. And behind me, I have Verzenet, which is one of the brand crews in Montagne de Rams. And one of the wines that we are tasting today uh, has a lot of grapes coming from this region. And as you can see right here, this is the Moulin de Verzenet. So the windmill, um, and this is south of France, really beautiful region. So I wish I was in Champagne today. I'm just at home, uh, just like you guys, but you know, that's uh, the beauty of Zoom webinars um, can connect us to, to everybody. And um, for the first day and to kick off Miami Champagne Way 2021, we have Asti Avalon, Master of Wine. So Asti is Finland's first Master of Wine. She's a champagne and sparkling wine expert and author of several books, including Asti Avalon's Champagne. If you can see in here, oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> so great book. And she's also the organizer of Grand Champagne Helsinki, which will take place May 2022. So put that date on the calendar. And um, Essie has been a guest last year for Miami Champagne Week. We did one event with Ruinar discussing Blanc de Blanc. It was a huge success. I'm really excited to have Essie this year talking about vintage. And we were talking just before you logged in about next year having Asti in person here in Miami. So yes, finger crossed for that. Um, hopefully we can have Asti. So without any further ado, please welcome Asti Avalon, Master of Wine. I'm really excited to hear about vintages in Champagne. Hello everyone. Really happy to be back at the Miami Champagne Week. Yeah, my second visit and hopefully I can come back uh, in uh, as a person next year. I hope what will uh, will have opened by then. Um, yes, last year we talked about Blanc de Blancs and this uh, webinar uh, is about vintages, but I'd say also equally lots about uh, Louis Roederer, the producer, as all of the vintages we'll be tasting today are Roederer. So I'll be talking a, a little bit about that house, uh, who is known as a Pinot Noir house. So just to, to, um, uh, to give a little bit of contrast to last year's uh, presentation. So um, yes, topic is vintage champagne, rather broad topic. So I'll be talking about the concept of vintage champagne. What does it mean? Um, what are the differences uh, between vintage champagne and prestige cuvee? And then I'll be talking about a uh, little bit about what makes a good vintage champagne. And then, um, and then also about um, some of the, the recent uh, exciting um, champagne vintages. So just maybe to start, um, start to go back in history a little bit, you know, in Champagne, uh, traditionally, um, the wines have been non-vintages throughout ages, you know, the time when Champagne has been a bubbly wine. Uh, and it has, of course, um, to do with the, with the quite uh, difficult uh, climate of the region, um, which, you know, makes the, the vintages rather uneven. So blending has been a very useful tool um, for evening out those differences. I'll share you my, uh, my screen now just to get started a little bit. So this, uh, this uh, uh, not maybe a pretty lady, but a powerful lady is, is uh, Madame Clicquot here, um, who made many, she was a great visionary in Champagne, one of the, the, the strong, the, the first widow and, and definitely one of the most influential. She did many innovations in Champagne and one of them being also the vintage Champagne. Um, to our knowledge, at least Love Clicquot has the, uh, the, uh, the archives, the best archives um, going back uh, the furthest. Uh, so Love Clicquot can prove that they were making a vintage champagne already in 1810. And in 1811 then, that's an even more famous vintage. Uh, it was the year of the comet um, at that time in Champagne. 
the comets were seen um, as some sort of um, you know good omen for a vintage. Uh, and there were the, the, the comets in, in 1811, and it be, became the year of the comet. Uh, Madame uh, Clipo really boosted the vintage and adopted uh, the comet as the house's, um, house's emblem in 1811. So since then, uh, a lot of producers, you know, started to do as Clicko did, so produce both vintages and non-vintages. And then later on, uh, they sort of added uh, the prestige cuvee category uh, to it, uh, starting with uh, um, both, I'd say both uh, Dom Perignon and Cristal. So Dom Perignon officially being produced already in uh, 1921, Cristal 1928. But of course, there was crystal made uh, for the Tsar Alexander uh, II of Russia already in, in the late, uh, um, late 18th century. So it was in that sense a, an older prestige cuvee even. So um, let me just see if I can go further. Yes. Um, so this is to talk about a little bit about what are the vintage champagnes. Um, so vintages, there are to, uh, there are three categories of champagne. So we have non-vintages, we have the vintages, and then we have the prestige cuvee. The prestige cuvee are not an official category as such. So they have to obey the rules of either vintages, if they are vintages, or if they are non-vintage wines or multi-vintage wines, they have to obey the rules of the non-vintages. So um, today, um, the non-vintages have, have really uh, become super important when it comes to the volume uh, and uh, the sort of the share of the, uh, the prestige cuvee has sort of eaten uh, the popularity of the original type of vintage cuvees. So as you can see from the statistics from uh, the, the Comité Champagne, in volume, uh, the, the so-called uh, vintage champagnes uh, only represent 1.2% of the production of champagne. So it's really minimal um, today and not even every producer makes them. Um, but then of course the cuvée de prestige, the prestige cuvées, uh, you can see there it's 4.9%. It's, uh, and almost all of these, um, these wines are of course vintage. There are only a few non-vintage prestige cuvee, uh, like the Cru Grand Cuvee or Laurent Perrier Grand Cycle or, or the Armand de Brignac cuvees. But in volume, those are not so important. So we can calculate uh, that these uh, the prestige cuvees uh, almost exclusively come uh, with a vintage on them. And of course, it's naturally uh, the, the vintages are more expensive than the non-vintages, so that we can see that uh, they represent a little bit larger share when it comes to value, 1.5%. And then, of course, the prestige cuvée, cuvées, which are in a completely different price uh, range, they would uh, make up as much as 16.5% uh, of the production, and they have been on the increase uh, lately. So we can we can say that six percent uh, of the production is, is has a vintage on it, and eighteen percent um, uh, in value when we measure it in value. Um, in Champagne, the rules differentiate between the non-vintage and the and the vintage. So a non-vintage has to spend uh, uh, fifteen months in the bottle, whereas a vintage cuvee they must declare the vintage at the time of uh, production. Uh, and then uh, they must spend uh, a minimum of uh, 36 months in the bottle. But uh, today, when you look at the vintages, especially from the big houses, they would spend a much, much longer time on the, on the, on the yeast lease um, from four years to very often even 10 years, as is the case with the Prestige Cuvée. So in general, there's a huge difference in style when it comes to the, the so-called non-vintages and vintages because of the longer aging. The, these wines are much more intense um, and uh, they have much more of these, these toasty, biscuity, rich um, um, flavors from the yeast um, aging uh, naturally. In Champagne, even if the EU laws, uh, you know, um, say that you can have some other vintage wines blended in it, but Champagne is very strict uh, in its uh, rules and 100% and of the wine must come uh, then from the vintage stated on the label. 
but this there is one little uh, little exception and it is the the wine that we use for the dosage uh, the sweetening uh, components uh, which can be any wine of champagne so it's not really restricted to this uh, particular um, vintage this would represent usually like one one to one and a half centiliters uh, from the volume of the bottle so it's not a lot but you know it still uh, has some some sort of a meaning uh, for for the wine. So what does it mean? What is the vintage then in Champagne? Uh, why should uh, should you buy it? Who buys the vintages? Um, I'd like to sort of uh, describe it as as the wine lovers uh, category uh, because in general in Champagne we or at least historically they always made uh, vintages just from the very good years. And on the, on the lesser years, the wines were all blended into a non-vintage. Therefore, it was made extremely um, easy for the consumer to understand the champagne vintages. You could always rely that when they make a vintage, it's going to be a good vintage. No matter, you know, stylistically, there are great differences between the vintages, uh, but still the quality was always there, which I think is great if you compare it to something like the wines of Bordeaux, the wines of Burgundy, which really sort of, uh, as a consumer, you need to know a lot about uh, the wines, or at least uh, Google at the at the moment of purchase, as they do make all the vintages, and there isn't even a big price variation between uh, the good ones and the bad ones. So that's I think has been one of the fortes of Champagne. They've really taken the consumer into into consideration that uh, trying to make uh, buying Champagne uh, quite um, quite easy. So the, yes, the styles vary. So when the when the producer makes the vintage champagne, they actually quite enjoy usually making them because um, uh, they have a lot of uh, you know artistic freedom when they craft the vintage champagnes. Because you know you saw from the figures, commercially they are not the crucial wines. Uh, so um, and there is no pressure for consistency. Actually, they don't want to go for the consistency. They really want to go for the wines that are most expressive for the year in question. So therefore it's something for a wine lover who maybe is more interested in understanding a region, following its vintages, um, say that there is this little bit of a, more of an intellectual, um, intellectual approach into the vintages and following their, their um, development. So today in Champagne, the, the situation is quite unusual because of the warming climate. Uh, you know, they can make vintage Champagne almost every year. If you think before, still in the 1970s, it was rather typical that uh, they would make a maximum of three vintages in a decade. But now it's more like they make eight vintages in a decade. And I remember discussing with the with the previous cellar master of Dom Perignon, Richard Geoffroy, and he uh, he dreamed of making uh, ten uh, uh, ten Dom Perignons in a decade, um, because um, he he thought that you know it's a challenge, of course, for them as a company and as winemakers uh, to make uh, make a vintage even in a in a more challenging year. But also he said that um, that. Um, um, it's uh, it's people are now much more ready to um, uh, to um, understand the different vintages and experiment. And uh, he said that he doesn't mind if you know everybody loves the 2003 or not. But it's a great thing that people are more interested in champagne and ready and and um, eager to to try its different um, vintages. So what is great about the vintage champagnes is, of course, that we don't need to pay as much as we have to for the prestige cuvee, uh, where we also, of course, there's an element of luxury uh, in them, which we sort of don't have in the, in the vintage champagnes. Um, they are also, um, you know, in champagne, they tend to use their the very finest uh, wines of the greatest longevity will be put in the, um, in the prestige cuvee which means that the prestige cuvées really, they can take time, but they also need time. So sometimes when they bring a prestige cuvée on the market, it still is tight and useful, and you feel like, you know, this would be, you know, better in five years time. But the vin with vintages, it, you know, very seldom is the case. They tend to be really lovely, open, rich, um, and generous already at the time of their launch, uh, which, 
make them wonderful uh, gastronomic champagnes for restaurant use, for instance, that there is no, um, no such need for, for cellaring them any longer. You can, you can just pop them open and enjoy almost immediately. So what makes then a good vintage? It's a very, very complex question and I will try to look at it from a few different uh, angles um, today. So um, in, in um, uh, you know, there can happen if you read through what has happened in Champagne uh, during the different uh, harvest um, years, it really, you know, almost anything can happen early on the season. But it really is only the August uh, that, you know, sort of August until the harvest that really um, uh, uh, decides on the quality of the harvest. And that's why in Champagne they have this old expression, ou faire le goût, uh, the August makes the taste. There are lots of these, um, these um, e uh, examples of vintages where, you know, the hopes were not very high, the, the harvest looked awful, and then the really nice weather just in the final weeks of the ripening, um, it, when it turned glorious, the wines uh, turned glorious as well. I think one of the, the best examples is the 2012 vintage, which we'll be looking in more detail today, where they had just about every possible viticultural hazard during the growing season. And still, at, as a result, so far, it, the wines are my favorite, uh, you know, it's my favorite vintage uh, of the, this millennium so far. So you can say that, you know, just about anything can happen, but, but the weather has to be right at the right moment then. Um, then, um, also, you know, in Champagne, you, it doesn't mean, it, you know, okay, in Bordeaux, often the case is so that, okay, at least today, they really, you know, love the warm years, say 2000, 2005, 2015, and of course, you know, 18 onwards. Um, but in Champagne, as the style is very different, it's not only just warm years that make great vintages. If I look at my favorite vintages uh, from the recent couple of decades, many of them come from the so-called cool vintages. Um, cool vintages, okay, 1988, which was already you know, beautiful um, at the time of its launch, uh, but especially we've seen now, you know, up until now, it has it seems to be beating its, you know, the famous trilogy. 88, 89, 90, there was a competition, which one you know, will be the best in the long run. And we can see now that it clearly was 1988, the, the coolest of the years, which has this sort of more acidity driven profile. The 2008 is very much of a super cool year with really these wines, the, the, the acidic backbone is, is the key to these wines. And, uh, uh, the 13 is of a similar um, uh, style, but there is a little bit more of, of sort of gravitas to those wines uh, than in the 2008. But then we have also wonderful examples of a warm vintages uh, already, you know, 45, 47, 49, uh, a lot of warm years from the 60s, 61, uh, we have the 76, 89, uh, which has held much better than the 1990. Uh, 2002, and we'll, we'll have to see how the wines of 2019 are, but at least it looks super um, promising so far. So we can't really uh, generalize um, on, uh, on these. Uh, there are lots of other um, elements that come to play. It's not just about the, the profile. Uh, but I'd say that it's a lot about a question of personal preference now, because we can have uh, a lot of these cool profile years, and we can have these warm profile years. I said earlier that I love the cool profile myself, but in this, uh, the first 20 years of this, um, uh, this century, we've seen a lot and a lot of these warm profile years, which are much richer, more, more um, generous, more wide, more vinous, uh, and they are not, they don't come with the raciness or sort of electric nature of, of some of the cooler champagne years. So we have vintage years like 2000, 2002, three, five, six, nine. Um, and then there was a little cooler spell in between, but then we had the 18, 19 and 12, 20. 
all of which are like very, very warm uh, profile years. And time will tell if, you know, this looks to be the new, new style of champagne or not. I see. Just before you move on, uh, we have two questions in here. So one, um, if cool years are better for Chardonnay and, and warm years better for red grapes. And then we have um, a question about the dosage wine from the same vintage. So if you want to uh, reply first for the cool years, better for Chardonnay and warm, better for red grapes, what do you think? Uh Yes, I mean, um, in Champagne, some of the winemakers like to say that every year is a Chardonnay year. So Chardonnay is the much easier variety to, to produce in Champagne. Uh, and you're quite right that in some of the cool years, it really does well. And Pinot loves, of course, much more, more, more heat and, and this sort of rich and, and muscular profile. Uh, but I'd say that even more important than, than the temperature is the, 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 the health of the grapes. Um, the Pinot Noir is the one that suffers most, uh, obviously, from the rot, uh, rot problem, and this would often be the, the problem of the cooler uh, years if they happen to be humid at the same time. So that, that, that's the reason why, you know, we, I'd say that we have less Pinot Noir years than we have um, Chardonnay years in Champagne. What was the other question about the, the, the dosage? Yes, um, so I think most people didn't know the concept about the dosage coming from any other vintage, uh, which was very interesting. So are there producers that use dosage from the same vintage or is there a, a name for this in case um, no labeling terms, right? If you use everything from the same vintage. No, not really. It's something uh, not, you know, even if you have a very, very detailed technical uh, details of each wine, you hardly ever see uh, the dosage wine mentioned. As I said, it's such a small amount of wine um, in, the, in the whole wine that uh, it's not usually uh, expressed, uh, you know, what it is. Every house have their own um, own um, philosophy for doing it. It's more about finding a wine that matches with the with the um, the, the wine that you are disgorging. Uh, for the big houses, um, I remember talking to Louis Roder, a winemaker, uh, once, and he said that he has tried, uh, you know, to use the wine of the the same vintage, but for some reason, they, it has never been a great um, a great marriage. Um, but yeah, uh, but all of them have like a, a, their own philosophy um, when it comes to the dosage wine. Like at Louis Roderer, they always use a, a, a crystal wine. It's it's the blend of crystal that is put into these large oak casks into the reserve wine cellar to age. Um, uh, and every single wine of Roderer will be um, uh, dosed with these sort of wines. So you can see that in, in every bottle of their Brut Non Vintage, there is a drop of crystal in it, which is, I think, a nice sort of, um, you know, a DNA, gives a nice DNA of crystal uh, to the wines of Roderer. There are some that always, uh, always use, um, at Perrier Jouet, always using a Grand Cru Chardonnay, uh, for instance, uh, Piper Heidsick and Charles Heidsick are known to have a huge seller of these, these wines for this purpose. They make very complex blends of rather mature, um, they, you know, mature reserve wines um, to bring this sort of extra, um, extra kick of uh, complexity right at the, uh, at the moment of, uh, of disgorgement. Um, sometimes I've heard that uh, that uh, some grower producers who who aim for more for like maximum authenticity in their cuvées they try to you know make uh, also the the dosage with the same uh, same wine that they have in the bottle, uh, but uh, but uh, this is not even very common uh, at the moment. Uh, Drapier, for instance, they have these um, a mix of these liquor wines. They have lots of them in the cellar, like crazy amounts. And I think the oldest of their uh, their um, liquor wines uh, um, come from the the 1940s. So they even have like they are stored in these glass 
uh, they are already mixed with the sugar. They are completely brown in color and, and super, super sweet and luscious. And, uh, you know, minuscule drops of these can be used in the dosage liquor, again, to, to add the, the sort of uh, DNA of, uh, of drop beer to the wine. So it's like the last uh, chance of the Stella Master to, to, to affect on the, on, the, um, on the balance of the wine and, and do the la last last little uh, tricks uh, to bring a more of this, uh, this house style to the cuvee. Did we have any more questions? No, I think we can go on for now. Thank you. Okay. Um, so um, the yield, you know, we always, when we talk about fine wines, we always talk about this, uh, like a lower yield um, is, is a better thing, you know, more concentration means a better wine. Um, and, uh, and lower yield years are considered better often than the higher year, um, yielding years. But this is not always the case with champagne, that we have to uh, remember that champagne is a little bit different wine, uh, where in champagne, um, it's also a question about the vivacity, the, the lightness, the energy, the raciness of the wine. And, and often if you make you know, too concentrated wine from too low yields, it can become a little bit heavy and lifeless. I think many of the wines from a vintage like 2003, uh, if you still remember that year um, yourself, it was like a super, super hot year. Uh, they had lots of problems in the vineyard. There was frost that ate a lot of the, the, the initial yield uh, potential. And then the, the summer was just so hot that there was a lot of stress, water stress, um, and the, the, the final yield was minimum. Uh, so, and it didn't mean that it was, was better. Uh, always, uh, but on a year where, where the small yield meant fabulous quality, it definitely was that challenging year of 2012, where I said that they had all the viticultural problems imaginable. Uh, but then um, also they had had so much frost early on the year and they had been hailed, they had been everything which had cut the yields. So they were relatively low, uh, less than 10,000 kilos a hectare. Uh, and because of this, the wines have really an amazing fruit concentration combined to a beautiful acidity. So there it really uh, was a wonderful um, combination. But the, but the main, uh, main um, exception uh, to this is the 2004 vintage. Uh, which was a very particular year uh, because it followed uh, the, the super ripe, uh, very low yielding 2003. So there was just so much energy, you know, kept in the, in the vines from the year before because they produced nothing, uh, that there was, the vines just went completely crazy. Uh, so the, what, they, what they could pick that year was 14,000 kilos a hectare, but the vines grew a lot and a lot more. They did green harvesting, they did everything, but still in many places, they would have as much as 18,000 um, kilos uh, per hectare. Uh, initially, because of this reason, you know, people um, were not so excited about the wines of 2004. They were thinking that they are diluted because of the, the large uh, yields. Uh, but time has proven differently, um, and I must say that um, 2004 is one of my absolute favorite vintages um, of, um, of this century. Uh, the wines are so feather light, they are so pretty, they are like ballerinas in, in their purity and, and precision and, and this sort of delicacy. They are like uh, really dancing on the palate. Um, they seem to be very, very slow aging, so much lower aging that say the 2002, which has been a very much hyped year. But these wines are taking time well, they seem to resist oxidation very well, and they really prove it wrong that it's not uh, always about um, the, the amount of the yield. Uh, the 2018 is a little bit similar story. Um, they, they picked uh, 12,361 uh, kilos, uh, but the nature again after the, the very poor uh, 2017, all the, you know, the stars were aligned, aligned right and, you know, they, they just 
produced, the vines produced a bumper crop. It, it was the year when, you know, people were in trouble because they didn't have enough tanks in their cellar. They were, you know, buying in, in desperation some sort of small, uh, small vessels where they could put the wines uh, because they were just so much around. And the same thing that, you know, the vines just produce, uh, it could be easily 16,000 to 19,000 uh, kilos per hectare hanging on the vines. And that's the paradox of champagne that you have this amazing quality on the vines, but you can't pick it um, because um, of, of the rules um, of the appellation. But it's fascinating. There are so many, you know, um, um, different things that affect um, a quality of a vintage. Um, is a good vintage year one where all the uh, varieties um, succeed equally? Not necessarily. Um, one can usually name one variety which does even better than the others. Um, but there are some years when I, I think that in 02 and 08, which were universally very, very successful vintages for everybody throughout the region of Champagne. So for that reason, all the, all the three varieties um, can be considered successful. Uh, I said earlier that all the years in Champagne are a little bit like uh, Chardonnay years, uh, and that was it, um, it was especially uh, in the sort of very, very cold and rainy and sort of uh, a bit rot troubled vintages like 7, 11 and 17. Uh, where we hardly see any prestige cuvee um, Pinot Noirs made, uh, but everybody made um, the Chardonnay. You know, in 07, we have uh, Conde Champagne, we have uh, Dom Brunard, um, we will have Charles Heitzig, Blanc de Millionaire, there was Salon made. In 11, uh, not many of them were made, but Tetanger just released their Conte Champagne in 2011. And in 17, um, I know that at least um, Conte Champagne and Dom Brunard uh, were produced, even if these vintages are sort of a little bit notorious in their reputation because they were quite problematic for the Pinot Noir. And then, of course, you know, when uh, when there is a Pinot Noir year, uh, it is a, really a great uh, year for Champagne because most of the prestige cuvées uh, and, and vintages contain a, an important amount of uh, Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is still the most widely planted grape of Champagne with its 38% uh, percent, uh, share. And there are some years where especially we can consider that uh, Pinot Noir was super successful, the years like 12, um, 19 and 2016. 2016 was a little bit problematic for Chardonnay uh, as it just didn't ripen. You know, normally in, in the 1980s and 90s, uh, Chardonnay always used to be picked earlier than the Pinot Noir. Uh, but now uh, in the last 10 years, we've actually started to see a lot of years when Chardonnay takes longer to ripen and they might even pick it after the Pinot Noir as they did in, in uh, 2016. And I think many did in 19 and, and 20 as well. So what it actually, uh, the, the greatness, you know, it's not a, just about um, acidity and sugar. It's it's easy to monitor the, the potential alcohol level. So the sugar in the grapes and the, um, and the acidity and follow on where they are at the right, when they have the, the right uh, proportions to the winemaker, the grapes can be picked. Uh, but much more important um, than the, just the numbers for the acidity and um, and uh, the um, uh, the sugar is of course the physiological ripeness of the grapes, uh, where you which you really need to examine, especially by tasting the grapes. So that's why you know um, in the weeks uh, preceding the harvest, all the champagne winemakers and growers are super busy tasting the grapes and, and determining the time when the seeds are completely ripe, uh, when the stems start to be ripe, and uh, um, because the at the right, uh, you know, physiological ripeness, um, then you also have uh, a much better um, concentration of pigments, flavor, precursors, and the quality of the tannins is much better. 
So therefore, um, you know, the, um, uh, with just hanging with the longer hanging time, we can of course make uh, the grapes uh, meet, you know, have a better, uh, bigger sugar level or, or lower acidity, but it's much uh, tougher to, to get the right uh, physiological ripeness uh, to the grapes, which uh, finally then, then um, determines uh, the actual quality of the harvest. So right, uh, I think we, we can go into the tasting uh, for those of you who have the wines uh, in front of you. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll discuss uh, first um, the, the 2013 vintage, which is a very intriguing one uh, because it's one of those sort of uh, last very late harvest years we've encountered. So um, the, the growing cycle, this, the, the winter and early spring were extremely um, cool and wet. So the, the vines really started to, to, um, um, to grow very late uh, and, the, and the, um, the flowering actually um, took as, uh, as late as it took place as late as uh, late June or even July. So this is extremely late uh, for champagne. Um, they, even if you know the wines taste like cool climate wines, they are super racy, they are really high in acidity, almost acidity driven. Uh, the summer actually wasn't that, uh, uh, that cool, it was actually very, uh, very warm and dry. Uh, but, um, but because the picking was uh, took place so late, um, the uh, already the majority of the grapes were picked in October. Uh, which meant that you know the, the ripening just wasn't going um, uh, going ahead uh, um, quickly in the cooling um, October weather. So that's why the wines, you know, even if they reached that physiological ripeness, the acidity stayed very high, uh, giving this sort of cool uh, cool vintage profile um, to them. The problem with the with the, the year, uh, there was some um, some rain um, in in uh, towards mid September when the harvest was starting, just before it. Uh, so there were some issues uh, with the uh, rot. Uh, but if you were able to you know combat those issues, the vintage is truly uh, wonderful with uh, with the great uh, purity of fruit, radiance of fruit, intensity of fruit, and, and great structure. These are really wines uh, for super long, um, uh, long keeping. You know, today we are talking so much about the 08 um, that we are forgetting about the great 2012 and the great 2013. These to me both are potentially better vintages than the 2008. And if you love the sort of racy profile of, of, um, of these vintages, now is the time to, to start buying them because we have, uh, you know, Louis Rutter Crystal is now um, on the market from this vintage and some others are coming uh, very soon. So this is the time to buy them and, and then you can keep them for uh, quite a long time. So uh, we will be tasting the. I don't actually have the first wine uh, myself here, so Alessandra will be my palate for it uh, today. Um, it's good practice for her master of wine. Let's see how how well she is doing. So we have the Louis Roder Vintage 13. So this wine, uh, as as Alessandra was saying, really comes from the 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 Montagne de Reims um, um, Pinot Noir area, Verzi, Verzene, the Grand Cru villages um, over there. So really, they are the coolest vineyards of, of um, Pinot Noir um, in Champagne. The, the grapes uh, uh, barely ripen, uh, but they bring this incredibly um, intense and racy, uh, racy wines. So at Louis Roder, the, the, the vintage estate uh, comprises mainly of, of Verzi and Verzene. And then um, the, the winemaker uh, Jean-Baptiste Le Caillon wants to add uh, some Chardonnay from Chouy in the Côte de Blanc for the freshness and, and uh, for, the, for the vivacity of the wine. And then uh, in a racy year like this, Roder did some malolactic fermentation to the wines. On certain years, they do none for the vintage, but in, in such a cool year as 13, they considered it uh, essential. And quite a large proportion were fermented in these large uh, oak um, uh, casks. They are do using like 5,000 liter uh, casks. 
to open the wines more, bring a certain generosity to the wines and dosed at uh, nine grams per liter. What are you tasting, Alessandra? Um, so I think the wine is fantastic and I haven't tasted this uh, or any 2013 yet. So this is my first wine that I'm tasting for uh, the 2013 vintage. So this is Louis Roder, uh, the, the just the, the um, Brut vintage 2013. And I, um, so yes, racy acidity. The acidity is very high, very powerful wine. So kind of fuels your palate as well. Um, and, and you can definitely notice the malolactic fermentation because on the palate, the wine, the wine is round, you know, despite the, the racy acidity. And then yes, you get the, the toasty notes um, from, you know, the, the long um, leaves aging and yes, very well integrated. So delicious. And, and, you know, I think that what you said about the difference between vintage champagne and prestige cuvée, it's uh, very important because even though this wine is powerful, it's racy, it is a vintage, it is ready to drink now. So it is very, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it is just delicious to drink right now. Yeah, I, I haven't tasted this one in a, in a, in a few months time, uh, but I tasted over the weekend uh, Louis Roderer's Blanc de Blanc 13, and it was a fabulous wine. It was like a mini crystal. I think the year was really successful for Roderer, really beautifully, like really uh, brightly shining, the incredibly shiny wines. That's really, really attractive, I find. Yes, a lot of yellow fruits in this wine as well from the Chardonnay. So, so yes, you have both. You have, um, you know, Pinot Noir giving structure and body, and then the racy acidity coming from the Chardonnay and the yellow fruits. So yeah, it's delicious, great wine. Yes, so Louis Roderer, um, um, they, um, they own themselves 240 something hectares of vineyards in, in Champagne. And most of them really are in premium locations. You know, it was already the Louis Roderer, the first who purchased uh, 100, an incredible 100 hectares estate. Um, uh, in a time where nobody else was uh, of the houses was interested in buying vineyards because the grapes were much, uh, you know, obviously cheaper and easier to, to purchase. But where he really wanted to go was to go to the what are today known as the Grand Cru villages and especially invest in the best uh, mid slope uh, positions. So that's why Louis Roder especially has a huge estate in Verzi and Verzene, uh, which form the backbone of both uh, of the vintage and the crystal. So today the uh, the, the 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 vines uh, the, the all the wines always come from certain estates. So every year they come from the same places. So it's quite unique in Champagne for a Champagne house to be so terroir oriented uh, with their wines that every year the origin is exactly um, the same. Uh, so there is uh, there's a Crystal Estate, there's a Crystal Rosé Estate, uh, there is a, a uh, Brut Nature Estate, uh, there is uh, the Rosé Estate, Blanc de Blanc Estate, and then the vintage estates. So, um, so Roder only buys grapes for their uh, non-vintage champagne, uh, which is now called collection. Um, you know, since since the last few months when they introduced the new new baby. So let's move onwards. If there are no questions on the the, the thirteen or comments on the wine, if somebody's been tasting it um, uh, with us. If not, we can go to the 2012, which I've uh, mentioned many times already, um, because it was such a special one. So um, uh, the, the early um, bud break, you know, spring started really early, um, but the, and the early bud break made the, the vines really vulnerable to spring frosts. So there were a lot of uh, um, localized uh, spring frost uh, problems. Um, the early growing season was wet, um, so it didn't really look particularly promising, uh, and it was really only in the later summer months uh, that things started to look uh, better. Uh, in August, they even had uh, this heat wave, um, uh, which resulted in a rapid accumulation of this, the sugar. But luckily, uh, very, very fortunately, the nights remained cool, which made the wines keep their uh, beautiful acidity. 
So it is really one of these rare high acid, high sugar September harvest, really, truly unique in its um, character. So picking started 10th of September, yield uh, quite low, uh, which gives a nice concentration to these wines, a uh, little bit more than 9,000 kilos a hectare. Average uh, potential alcohol, very high for the champagne standards, 10.6. And acidity 7.8, so very nice and high uh, for, for um, champagne. So when we, we start to, um, to taste uh, the, the Stark uh, Brut Nature, a very special cuvee of Louis Roderer, um, this wine was first produced in 2006 and after that um, 2009 and 2012. Um, it's, it is the first Brut Nature, so bone dry champagne of Louis Roderer. Um, the winemaker very long believed um, that he couldn't make uh, with the houses, uh, you know, the winemaking style of no malolactic fermentation, that he couldn't make a Brut Nature uh, champagne, it would be too acidic. Um, but uh, then they started this cooperation with Philip Stark, uh, the designer, which actually isn't uh, just about, you know, the label. Uh, which is quite fun in itself, but he really uh, did a lot of uh, input into the philosophy of this wine because he's really into natural wines and biodynamic things and and um, no sugar and that sort of things. So it was given us, us a little bit as a challenge to the winemaking team that what could they um, do in a little bit in the spirit um, that uh, Philip Stark wanted. So it meant that they went only for the so-called continental years of Champagne. So the meaning the warm years of Champagne. And they went for a very warm site. Uh, so all the, the grapes are grown in their estates in Cumier, which is very close to Epernay. It's on the northern side of uh, the Marne River. So it's a sloping vineyard, nicely sloping vineyard, um, looking uh, directly towards uh, uh, south. So it's extremely warm. Um, the, um, the soil has a fair amount of uh, clay in it. So clay in a, in a wet year uh, is, of course, a cool terroir. But in a warm year, it's a warm terroir and it brings a nice generosity to the wine, which they wanted to have uh, to make a wine taste uh, delicious, even as a brut um, mature. So um, um, what is also unusual about uh, this wine is that it's a so-called field blend. You know that normally, you know, champagne is, is blended sometimes in the spring, um, you know, from different batches, different single vineyard uh, wines, different varieties kept separately. But for this one, it's one single day when they pick the grapes. So the entire picking team, be it 100 people or 200 people, are, are sent to Cumier, uh, pick the grapes in one day, and they are all co-pressed and co-fermented all together. So this sort of traditional blending of champagne doesn't have to take place at all. So this is a sort of a look into the, the old days, the golden old days of champagne, where a lot of these, uh, these wines were blended as, um, as field blends. So there is uh, zero dosage, so no added sugar, uh, and the uh, sulfur addition is also really minimal. Um, so um, I found that the two first vintages, the six and nine, I wasn't such a big fan of them, especially with time, uh, because you know if you have brut nature and low sulfur, it's a very dangerous combination because sugar is a preservative and uh, and also the sulfur is an antioxidant. So if you minimize both of them, uh, it's very usual that your wine oxidizes very quickly. Uh, but I'm really happy to see I followed this wine maybe for three years now, and it's really as, as pure and bright as it was at uh, the time it was launched. So um, I can see they are on a rather steep learning curve uh, when they are making this more natural wine um, type of a, of a champagne. So the, for this one, as it is a really, you know, quite a, a warm uh, year with, with a lot of generosity built into the wine, uh, there is no malolactic fermentation performed um, to it. On the nose, it starts to have nice, a little bit toasty evolution. The, the fruit is extremely pure, um, lots of white uh, fruit, like very ripe peaches, uh, apricots, but there's also a lemony. Uh, lemony tone to the wine and a bit um, this sort of 
saline uh, touch to it as well. Very attractive. There is good width, roundness, body on the palate, but when you swallow it, uh, then comes the kick of the acidity, which really leaves the palate super clean um, and um, and sort of um, pure, and it and it wants you to you know makes you want to have the next next sip immediately, which is also a good uh, uh, sort of uh, asset of a good wine. You want to drink it. Um, Heather is also drinking the wine, so she says she's very surprised with the taste. She's not a fan of bone dry champagne, but she finds this one delicious. Yeah, yeah, but that's that's you know a lot of effort has been as as I explained has been made. You know a lot of consideration, a lot of effort has has been made um, uh, in favor of this wine so that it can be this pleasant uh, and uh, and balanced and generous and drinkable uh, even bone dry. I think it's um, I'm not I personally I'm not a fan of the trend today that we have more and more brut nature champagnes. I'm not interested about the amount of sugar in the wines. I'm just interested in the balance of the wine. But so very few of the bird natures that we have on the market uh, actually have that balance. I find that um, bird natures often, well, they can be bitter. Uh, they can be too acidic. And very often what troubles me the most is, is they are quite short. The taste is just uh, sort of cut off. Um, much um, prematurely, and also they often lack that sort of deliciousness factor, which I think is essential in in um, great champagne. But I think now more and more, because we are you know making more of them, we are understanding brut natures better. We are getting more and more really good brut natures as well. And I forgot to mention uh, about the biodynamic uh, ways of Roderer. So they are the, the uh, biodynamic uh, leader in, in Champagne overall. From Champagne's vineyards, uh, less than 3% are, are um, cultivated organically. Uh, Roderer themselves has at the moment some 125 uh, um, uh, hectares cultivated organically. Uh, and all of them actually uh, also biodynamically. Some of them are still in the conversion process, but they will all be certified um, then um, one day. And this uh, this Cumier estate uh, is biodynamic uh, in its entirety. So we have a, this one is also a biodynamic one. Not certified, at least not on the label that I can exactly, see here. Exactly, okay. the, it, the process is still. But then the um, Crystal Rosé is 100% biodynamic too, correct? That's right. And and Crystal also these days, I think the 12, uh, if I remember correctly, 12 was the first uh, white crystal that was made of uh, biodynamically grown grapes, but not yet certified. The certification is yet to come. So that's why they don't even, you don't, uh, you know, they don't mention it anywhere other than, um, than you know, just by saying it, uh, because of course, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's um, a problem for somebody if you say that the wine is biodynamically cultivated, but you don't have a certification. So therefore, um, they don't really want to emphasize it in the communications at this point until they, they get the, their full certification. Okay, let's move on. So we we go to the 2007 vintage. It's actually nice to look at a more uh, more mature vintage um, uh, of a, a vintage or a prestige cuvée wine in this case. So quite a uh, quite a um, sort of um, promising beginning of the growing year. Very warm spring uh, led to early flowering. But then actually the summer was quite the disaster, one of the, the worst, uh, worst um, on record. 
uh, but then came the the famous uh, last minute sunshine in August, which sort of rescued the quality of of uh, the harvest. Not so much uh, of the Meunier and the Pinot Noir, but Chardonnay actually did very well. And the Chardonnay wines um, of the year um, possess this lovely, cool, cool vintage profile um, to them. So uh, a harvest was already, because of the very early um, start of the, the, um, the growing season, the, August, uh, the harvest already took place in August, August 20th. Uh, yields were rather high, um, alcohol was, was sort of average and, uh, and acidity was on, on the high side. So that's the usual uh, balance um, of the 2007 as we have. Uh, crystal on this year, um, uh, sometimes, you know, crystal can have as much as 70% of, uh, of Pinot Noir, but as this was a more a uh, Chardonnay year, there's an unusually high amount of uh, Chardonnay in the wine. Um, and the dosage is a nine and a half grams as also the level uh, sugar level for crystal has, has gotten lower over the recent years. So let's, uh, let's taste crystal. It's actually very nice to taste it because the current vintage is 2013. So there's been quite a few years since this wine was uh, released. So we start to see, you know, where, how is it aging? Um, you know, often some, some of these prestige cuvées, they are glorious at the beginning, but then they might close and reopen, you know, to the, again, to a, a, a full bloom, a different bl bloom, often maybe 10 years later. So I'm, I'm very curious. I haven't tasted the seven for, for, for a little while. So it's, uh, it's very, very good to be tasting it uh, now. Not much evolution in the color. It's, uh, it's still youthful. Uh, um, medium deep lemon. Mm, the nose is rather expressive. It has uh, a fair amount of uh, toast, um, toast, but um, there is also a bit of toffee. It's like this sort of maturing note of Pinot Noir. More on the nose, even if the proportion of Chardonnay is rather high, um, I'm getting a more, more Pinot nose with sort of a little bit of red fruit, apple. Nice spiciness. It has really like a white pepper, white pepper spiciness to it. On the palate, it's super crisp. Really nice lightness to it. Lots of energy, very pure fruit. Nice, um, nice uh, juiciness, uh, succulence of the fruit and long finish. This is actually at a, at a nice moment right now that it hasn't closed. It's actually delicious now. It has a lot of, you know, still super youthful elements, but it starts to uh, show more of these uh, complex aromatics uh, from post disgorgement aging. I think this will be a crystal definitely for the mid, you know, if we consider the, the drinking window of crystal. I think this will be a relatively long lived um, one, um, not, not to the extent that the eight or 12 or 13, but you know, there's certainly no, um, no hurry with this one. It uh, seems to be aging quite slowly if you think that uh, this should have at least five years um, on the cork now. With crystal, it is essential, okay, with all wines uh, or champagne especially, it's essential that you, you really take care of them, uh, the um, storing um, conditions if you want to keep the wines for long. Even a month in poor, uh, poor conditions or, um, you know, even, even 20 degrees does make the taste um, 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 alter, you know, develop to a less um, um, favorable direction. Um, I like it actually 12 degrees is rather cold, uh, rather, rather warm for, uh, for aging uh, champagne gracefully. I like myself uh, when I've done these aging experiments, I like uh, often a temperature from uh, uh, as cold as six. It really age, it makes champagne age super slowly and very, very gracefully.
And which, with crystal, I always uh, I recommend that you keep the cellophane on at all times uh, because uh, it, it is um, extremely vulnerable to the light in its uh, clear glass uh, bottle um, because um, um, the, the rays of, um, of light, the different rays, just uh, damage the wine within minutes. You know, you can go outside in the sunlight uh, or you can leave it on the table and you can get the, the taste of light very quickly. So even if I chill it in the fridge, I always keep it on uh, and I, I only remove it when I've, uh, I've finished the bottle. And I think it's, uh, it's, it is really worthwhile um, doing that. So why is the bottle then uh, clear? Uh, well, it was a wine made for the Tsar Alexander II of Russia and his court, you know, the court was at the, at the time drinking 30% of the production of Roderer, so they were really successful in Russia. And the Tsar wanted something more special for himself and he ordered a wine in, in a clear, uh, uh, you know, crystal bottle. Um, the, they made it for a couple of years, but the, the crystal of that era wasn't strong enough to, to, uh, to manage the, the um, pressure um, uh, of champagne. So most of the bottles broke and they, they shifted into conventional uh, bottles. But when the, the sort of commercial release of the wine was made much, much later after the, 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 um, you know, the fall of, the, of, of Russia, um, then they still wanted to keep it in the clear glass um, bottle, which is, of course, a very special story, but it is a very, um, very big challenge when you want to um, serve and, uh, and store um, crystal, of course. Do we have any, um, any questions? Um, we do have a few questions. So I'll begin with the labels for crystal. So um, Guilherme was commenting here that some crystal have a more red label and other ones have a more silver type of label if this is has to do anything with vintages because i know the internet or google has said um you know that warm vintages have the redder or more red label and um cool vintages have the silver label have you ever heard about this or is just I've absolutely never heard about that <laughs> okay <laughs> and i should know if that's the case i've never actually heard of that so in which of, of which vintages are we talking recent ones or old ones recent ones uh, so he's mentioning the 2007 with a red uh label background and 2008 with a silver background so so i guess you know and maybe no, it's just no, 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 no. I think the red, the, the red must be a crystal rose, and then there is the crystal vinotech, which has the silver. Um, oh, that is true. Okay, yeah. so, I, yeah, I think probably that's the, case. the vinotech. Yeah. Okay. Um, then uh, Brenda is asking, how does tasting change as crystal ages? Ah yes, uh, so in the in the early um, early years, crystal is really it's all about the purity. It's just so pure. Um, it's uh, I, I always call it as the you know the clear blue sky or or crystal clear. It's all about that radiance of of really uh, super clean. Um, delicious fruit that is what crystal is when it's young but of course when when you start to evolve it you get much more complexity uh, crystal doesn't get super toasty it gets a little bit toasty especially on these more reductive um, years like 04 um, it's it's particularly toasty um, it does gain a lot of uh, sort of i'd say fruit weight uh, vinosity power as it's made of Pinot Noir, even if it, as, as a young wine, it seems quite uh, light and elegant, but it gets much more powerful over time, G gaining more of these sort of spicy, savory, um, savory uh, notes, um, often, often uh, some, some of these like toffee, um, toffee type um, aging um, ca characters. What is curious about crystal is actually that um, they use uh, deliberately a much, uh, you know, a much smaller amount of yeast than in champagnes normally. They really want to minimize the yeast uh, because they don't want the yeast to take over the wine. So they really want in crystal um, the, the, the terroir to shine. And that's why it ages quite differently to something if you compare it to Charles Heitzig, which are really those sort of yeasty richness. Um, 
you know, derived prestige cuvee. So crystal is all about the fruit and that, uh, uh, that low um, yeast, I feel, also affects its, um, its aging. And the other question we had is about the 2021 vintage. Um, have you tasted some of the base wines or uh, not yet? Well, I'm actually going to Champagne tomorrow, so you can ask me after after tomorrow. I know better because um, I, I wasn't able to go to during the harvest time as we had the, the Champagne and Sparkling Wine World Championship tastings going. But now it'll be good to go and see what the result is. Um, I was there for a long period during the summer and it was terrible. It was I, I was there for five weeks and it rained every day for four weeks uh, in a row. And sometimes, you know, there was like these tropical pours of amazing amount of water in one go, which is not so typical of champagne at all. So there was lots and lots of problem with mildew. Um, mildew not necessarily uh, affects quality so much, um, but uh, but then they had some problems with powdery mildew and uh, and uh, as, as well as rot. So I'll only now that I talk to the winemakers, we'll know better what the final, you know, final conditions uh, were at the time, but this won't be one of the greatest, yes, that's for sure. Um, and then two final questions. One, uh, how do you feel about decanting champagne in champagne carafes? Uh, for vintage champagnes, do you feel that it opens up or you don't use it? I don't really myself uh, use um, the carafes a lot. I find that they, especially if you are carafing older vintages, you know, you just lose a lot of the bubbles. What I like to do myself is that I open the bottles uh, in good time um, and, and it's really necessary to use uh, like quite large um, sized glasses, uh, which open the wine uh, very efficiently. And what I like to do is that I pour only a little bit at one time and then you top up, you know, refresh the wine on a regular basis. This, I think, that opens the wine in the most efficient manner that you have, you know, the old material, which is open and, and, and you know, giving in the glass. And then you still, you know, keep it uh, fresh and, and pleasant uh, with the new wine all the time. So I think that that is a better way than, than decanting. Yeah. Sometimes Absolutely. some people like to do it for like a, um, really young prestige cuvee champagnes, which they might feel are too aggressive with the bubbles and too young. But uh, but I personally, I'd still you know go for this little bit more more um, delicate way of of um, handling the wine. I think you just lose too much of the bubble. Okay. Um, and then we have a final comment here from Simone. She's a WCT diploma student. Um, she says that. This has been illuminating and where can she find your book? So do you have the book available in the US at all? Uh, I don't think, I think the Christie's book, uh, the Christie's World Encyclopedia, which I do together with Tom, it should be uh, available in the, um, at least in Amazons and many other places in the US, it's published by Bloomsbury. Um, so that should be easily easy to find. But the other one is, unfortunately, uh, it's a problematic one. It's still available in, I, I don't have any copies myself anymore. Uh, the only copies uh, I have are in Amazon in, in, in Europe. So you can get it from there, but, uh, but not from many other places. All right, okay. We'll have to travel to Europe to drink yes. some champagne and buy a book mm -hmm. then, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I think um, these were all the questions and yeah, any final comments about the wines or anything? Yeah. Okay. Um, Great. Yeah. Well, I hope it was a good start to the, to the Miami Champagne Week. I'm, I'm a bit, uh, envious that I can't take part in person to the to the events you have uh, coming later on this week. In 2022, Essie, we'll make it happen. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yes, um, so thank you very much. So amazing wines, all these wines are available at 305 Wines if you need them. Um, but yes, great, great comments about the vintage and, um, and you know, the vintage champagnes and then the specific vintage. So thank you very much for sharing all your knowledge with us. And yes, and you know, we'll see you soon then. Wonderful. All right. Thank you, thank you all. Thanks. Have a, all right. Have a great day. Bye-bye.